after the war, my father worked in with my grandfather in that, the factory that they saw. There was a, a factory underneath, in the basement, underneath the shop front, and uh, so and they had big vats and a big paddle that they used to have to wind manually, so they might have to turn to stuff the ingredients over for half an hour or, or whatever the time was, but it was all just done manually, and they had to wear masks, because you were down in the basement, and I can't recall, well, in the basement, there, there's just no windows, and I'm, I'm sure back in those times there was no air gone. Mm. So, um, and uh, so they used to manufacture and then bottle uh, or put into tins the rub it off the sand soap that, that they sort of used back then. And, uh, but often, well not often, but now and again of an afternoon, my mum would call in and I, I think we, she might have gone in on the tram or something and then gone home with Dad. My father, after the war, uh, came back, but it had a kidney out and all his gear had gone to Singapore, all his mates went and none came back. When he uh, came back, he felt that his body was weak and he uh, he couldn't do the stuff, that he, the physical stuff he had to do, so he went up to uh, Charters Towers, I think it was, pretty sure, and went cane cutting for quite some time to try and build himself up. I don't know if he built himself up or wrecked himself doing it, but so he's quite, uh, so I, like I never saw him for quite some time. Then when he did come back, he went into picture theatres, so, and he was always in for art, and I remember when uh, the first, what they called it, the cartoon carnival, was all cartoons, and he would uh, draw the Mickey Mouses and the Plutos and that sort of, sort on white paper, about the sizes of these walls, mm -hmm. and they would all be taped up outside the theatre with all the things. But uh, he did a wonderful job with that. And I think it was a Friday night. My mother and I went to the pictures, what I call everything. It was in black and white. And it was like the Stooges and the stuff that you think is a bit hammy now. And, uh, there were some of the ones that were actually silent. And talkies came in, mm -hmm. which was big. And then, but as far as my father went, uh, because he was working in the movie theatres, his hours were completely the opposite to what I was as a kid, because I had to go to school. He slept in in the mornings. Might pass now and again, but most times he or I were asleep, so we used to leave <coughs> notes. Most of what I remember, that's all. The, then, after he was in the theatres for years, was Calvin Grove, Ash Grove, and and Red Hill are the main ones. They, the one guy and the, the all three. So he uh, and, and they used to have the loud problems back in those days. Wallace Johnson, I think, was the guy's name. And uh, when things got bad at, at, at one of the theatres, he would change my father around to that theatre. You know, he, he was allowed to come out to go home and find someone letting his tyres down, <laughs> all that sort of thing. Or, and they had the old canvas seats back in those days and the kids, the troublemakers, would tear them with a knife and things like that. So they still had their shares of trouble in those days, but it sort of, I don't think it's anywhere near as vicious as what happens today. But it, each theatre he went to built up and each theatre he went to had no trouble. But he, he was constantly changed <laughs> between to try and keep peace, you know, because they were all within a, a fairly short drive of each other, the Red Hill Ash Grove and... Kelvin Grove, I don't even know if they're there. I don't think the Kelvin Grove one's there. Um, and I, I never go to Ash Grove, so I don't know. During the war, and there was uh, the scare that the Japanese, I think they were a little two man submarine or something, got into Sydney Harbour. I'm not sure if even one night might have got into Brisbane, but for some reason there was a panic that the Japs were going to come. And I think they, they bombed part of Darwin at one stage. Uh, so uh, a lot of people then, the, the term they used to use, it's like they migrated from where they were and uh, we went to Ellera, just out of Warwick, and uh, it was Chris, Mum, Marshall and myself. I have an idea that John may have come along, but he was only, only a baby, so we didn't have a lot to do with him. But the place that we were, were in, the, the, we stayed with a family called Rules, and they uh, made the soft drinks for the area. And I can't even recall, time didn't mean anything to me then, but I don't know how long we were there. It was quite a long time, I, from what I recall, and the factory and house were, were in the one block of ground, and right next door was the 
cattle sale yards and uh, there was holding pens over the road as well for there was because there was two sales a week, one through the week and one at the weekend. So we were marshal and I spent a fair bit of our time at the sales, just obviously something to do. You know, and from where we came from, you didn't see cows and all that. So we were quite lucky, I guess. And, uh, and, and everybody was safe then. We used to roam around a bit and go through, through the paddocks. You know, just be careful that there wasn't any rogue animals in them paddocks because we get, got a fright one time when a bull chased us and uh, they had uh, the bindi eyes. They were like a, a three prong I think. It had three actual heavy prickles and they just used to go into your foot. And it used to stop me but the older guy who we were always with was uh, John Rule, one of the sons of the guy who manufactured the drinks but he had cells on his feet like leather. He, said he could walk all through the paddocks and, and show no sign of a limp or anything. But one time when the bull was coming, he, he ended up, he had to come back and pick me up and, and run with me on his back. And we got out of it. And, uh, <laughs> but they, they were good years. And then when we finally went back to Brisbane, the rural family on occasion used to come down and stay with us for a week or something if they were on holidays or wanted some time off. So, they're really nice people, and I can't even remember eating there, but we would have, because we actually lived in the house with them. They, you had a couple of their mum had one bedroom, and Chris had another, and Marshall's with Chris, and I guess they had use of the kitchen too, if they wanted to, I, I can't recall, and that really didn't mean much to me. You ate when you're hungry and squawked, and they, they put something in your mouth. Most of my memories uh, as a kid was the fact, being on my own, it was the real uh, thrill to be going of a weekend or Sunday, normally Sunday afternoon, to one of the uh, uncles or aunties' places where you met up with the kids again, the other fellas, because they all had mates, but while I had the kid down the back and all that sort of stuff, I never really had the uh, uh, the same feel about everything as obviously the others did, and then and they were sort of my family. Mm. So that uh, that made uh, uh, it was, it was um, an event that everybody seemed to look forward to, because back in those days you didn't go to the beach or, um, or anywhere you do, it, everything just re I think financially just revolved about around the families and it was a, a cup of tea and a, a sandwich or, or whatever you know I, I, I'm trying to think of how old I was when we first went to a cafe I mean, it was a there was always there had to be a reason to go to something like that, and, and like a, a fairly good reason. It wasn't just a normal birthday or something. It was something really special. Uh, but uh, I had uh, happy enough uh, times as a kid because I, while I saw my cousins, and it was really great. I also saw how they blued between themselves, that's yours and that's, you've got my stuff. <laughs> and I go home and I think, well, I, I really don't have that. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, but in the early days, I guess Marshall was the guy that I saw most because uh, he was the eldest of the others. And uh, the two women, the two sisters, stuck together pretty well, um, more probably than the brothers and sisters, although although we still used to go to the, the others too, but the, the two sisters were really close, oh. and close with their mother, my grandmother. So uh, it, it was, that was what I virtually remember the most, is meeting up with Marshall and and the others as we went down, but um, it, it was more 
it was more the McCarran side in the early days that, that I remember because uh, both uh, the guy uh, during the war uh, everybody was in the army which put Chris and Mum closer together so uh, we uh, as a kid uh, when my father got shipped off to uh, off to uh, the Sunshine Coast I don't know where he'd been before that or where uh, what area he was in but I remember that uh, they were sent up to uh, Caliandra so uh, Chris and Mum and Marshall and myself went up there for a few days, I think it was, and Mum met up with Dad. And the, everyone came back from the war, and there was a little uh, gatherings at different times with everybody again. Mm -hmm. But then as kids started to grow up, and kids have got their own things that they have to do there at all, all different schools and things like that, and I guess playing their different sports or whatever, and, uh, uh, um, well, a lot of that stuff fell away, the, the closeness, because mm -hmm. you just never um, met up with them. Uh, you might have a Christmas party or something, and uh, most of the families would get there, but uh, it, 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 that side of it all changed. Not the, the closeness so much, but just the physical being there. Mm -hmm. uh, the school days, as you went through, I, I remember my grandmother buying a pair of shoes to go to school. Yeah, and of course, we, you were used to shoes, and so you'd put them on until you got around the corner and take them off again. And you made this the sports as you went on through school, uh, nearly all sports were in bare feet, running, jumping, uh, and even even when they were playing cricket, most of the kids still had bare feet. You know. uh, it wasn't until uh, I got old enough to play tennis, and, that just, and you had to have sand shoes on your feet for, mm -hmm. for that. That you sort of stuck to get used to shoes. But footy first, it was still all bare feet. I could still, I could run with a ball, on it, but I could not understand how they could place it with a ball on the ground and then boot it with the bare toe <laughs> without breaking your toe. It just didn't seem. They used to kick it from sort of the underside of their toes with that ball of your foot. And oh, okay. Just it up. And uh, he, you'd only want to miss a bit <laughs> and you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and I played in the, the league team for the school, and I played in the tennis team for the school as we got on. And then they were having trouble with the, the, they brought the boxing into the club, you know, and they were having trouble getting kids to go in. So it was a move if you went in, you got no homework for the weekend. <laughs> so I was in that. And every Wednesday afternoon, you would go into the different schools and and fight somebody. Uh, then the had the uh, state titles and uh, I've been to a few schools and I've won a few fights but so if you got into the uh, semi-finals and finals it was held at the old stadium which was a big corrugated iron building where the festival hall is now. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if the festival hall's there now. Mm -hmm. Is it? Or not? I don't know. But mum and dad never knew what I was doing. Didn't they? It was on the Wednesday. I had to fight on a Wednesday night there, so I had to come clean. What was their reaction? They weren't too happy with the whole thing. And of course dad was still with the movie theatres, so he couldn't take me in. So Alec Weidman took me in and I got cleaned up. But my height, I don't know how high the ring was, but it was eye height for my because I, I remember scraping along losing my side for a, uh, a minute or so in one, one stage just to stand up in front of a whole heap of people uh, and you're not used to that you almost freeze uh, you wish to God you weren't there I remember and uh, they had the ringside seats then behind the ringside seats they had chicken wire and everything that went right up so, so the people in the bleachers because they'd take their rob and everything in and, and then they'd throw bottles. 
Good God. So uh, I, I, I can even remember us now. I can see the guy in front of me. And uh, I'd frozen, you know, with all these people. Mm -hmm. Uh, the ballot line, I'd gone out the middle, but I still really wasn't aware. It still hadn't come to me, and uh, he clocked. Oh, yeah, yeah, then I, I knew I was into it. <laughs> Were you able to land a couple on Oh, yeah, because, uh, I mean, you forgot everything else. So then I thought after that that tennis was probably easier. And I went to industrial high art, <coughs> uh, uh, that's because this, see, this was uh, when you were primary school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one guy who had been Queensland champion for oh, about four years in a row. And then he uh, he just won the uh, Australian title. But they couldn't get anyone to fight him. Just on one of the afternoons, someone asked me if I'd just have a fight with us to help make up the program. So I, I did, you know, but I wasn't in training or anything. I did pretty well. So when they couldn't get anybody to fight this guy, I had two guys come up on each side of me and pull me on in front of him. Hey, we got a guy who'll fight you. That's when I finally found out what peer pressure was about. And you can't not do it in mm. front of They weren't going to do it. I got a real hide in that day. I, first half round or so, I held pretty well. But uh, I, I ran out of path. And, uh, and the guy was just so sick. So anyhow, I had no more fights after that. You became a pacifist. <laughs> if there was trouble in the schoolyard, did the little kids come to you for yeah, help? Because you were a boxer? Yeah, they did. And there was, a, there was one gang in particular, and the leader of the gang's father was a local sergeant of police. And the, their thing was always that his father was going to get you and all that sort of stuff. But any kids that were in trouble always fell down. And uh, uh, the, police, the, uh, the teachers used to always have someone patrolling mm -hmm. yards at that time. I, I saw this gang <coughs> pick the young kid out and uh, singled him out from the rest of the kids and they were all, all around him. Someone was yelling, yeah, could I help? You know, so I, went. I was lucky because if you had a bit of a reputation, you didn't really have to do anything, just be there and they would disperse. And then uh, one of the teachers uh, gave me his full blessing, you know, mm. do whatever you have to. So you managed to save one little kid? I saved a few of them. <coughs> As I say, you didn't really have to do anything, just be there, because of the bully guys. Into it. Yeah.
Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. And with the scuba diving, you had a bit of an incident with boat. With the boat, yeah. He was in that incident too. <laughs> he, uh, it was quite rough, and when he got out, he uh, he was just laying on the bottom. He was sick. He'd have been better off to go into the water, because once you're in the water, mm. uh, all the bobbling stops. But anyhow, he went. Uh, he lay, he lay down and there was three of us went down and then when we came up it, it had got, weather had got wilder and the anchor had given way and as we came up, uh, Ian who was uh, still on the boat was passing the mouth of the Tweed River going north. So we swept them over onto uh, Cook Island, took all our gear off, and kept waving across to the mainland, you know, and then someone actually started to wave back. You're never dead sure if they're just waving. Or... <laughs> but uh, anyhow, the, the, the rescue people came out. It was just on dark, and they, they went and they uh, picked Ian up, and they got him, he was, uh, I think he was about five or six miles off Kira by then. Mm. But they wouldn't go anywhere near the boat, so we had to jump in the water and go over to them. And uh, then uh, he uh, uh, came and they picked us up mm -hmm. and then took us in. And the boat actually beached on the northern end of Stradbroke about 9 o'clock the next day. But uh, different people had seen it going, mm. and by the time we got to it, the compasses were gone. And uh, uh, then the, uh, there was only could only find one oar, you know, even. And uh, uh, Ian went real quiet. And, uh, and, uh, I said, "Well, you, 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 did you throw the other one oar? Well, what happened to him?" He said, "Well, no, not really." But he said, "I couldn't get the boat to go, and the motor wouldn't go." He said, so I smashed the oar across it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, he, but he did admit it. He <laughs> said, so I knew you weren't going to find the other one. Because I was looking up and down the beach thinking I would to be. And that was the Witten Court, wasn't it? Yeah. The boat, the yeah, Witten Court. Yeah. And then you got the one that you called the Beachway, the bigger boat. But, yes. And it, it was a 19 footer and far bigger. It was a trick trying to get that one down under Beach Haven, Beachway though, because it, yeah. we only had about an inch on each side and you had to back it off the esplanade down into the thing. Down into the basement? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty amazing the things that you used to yeah. do. That was my father bought that home. I know I got into a lot of trouble over that, but he bought it home. Did he? Yeah. I thought you laid him across the Story Bridge. I did. Oh. <laughs> I, well, yeah. No, yeah, well, but it was him who did the deal with the guy who wanted to get rid of the horse. Oh. But it, well, he wanted to go to a good home. Yeah, no, I, I went and got it. And I did ride across the I wouldn't ride across the bridge now. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I mean, never had any saddles or anything like that. Yeah really hurt myself when I, it came up Hensel Terrace and I thought, because it was always one to go and I thought, well, up this hill, I'll let you wear yourself out a bit. Well, he went up the hill all right, but he, he just didn't let up. He down and was straight along the flats and coming straight to our place and there's the fence right in front of me and he just stopped and twirled at the fence and oh, I smashed into the bloody fence. I could hardly, could hardly actually get up or oh. feel anything and uh, I wasn't sure if I was badly hurt or I wasn't badly hurt. And uh, one of the neighbours over the road, do you remember the McGills? No, not no, really. Okay. No. Uh, no, oh no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. No. Uh, he went and grabbed the horse, 
because he was out cutting the flowers or something, he was doing something out in the yard. Took, uh, took it back in and put it in the yard, but it, it actually did crack the fence. You were hitting it? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah that, it was like a brick fence, you know. That, but it, a part of it was, uh, it had bricks on end with holes between them and a capping on the top. Well, that's not real, real strong, you know. And probably just as well, because that's the part I hit, and a bit, it gave way, so that cushioned it, I guess, a bit. <laughs> if it had been really rigid, it would have been in trouble with it, because I, and I smacked my head out. And, and I've never I've never actually ever been knocked out, but I was really close then because I, I, my head was spinning and I couldn't get, get my feet set, you know, that you weren't just were wobbling. Mm-hmm. And then Mum used to, because the horse was always in, in the yard, and he used to stay at the gate, because that's where everybody comes. And Mum, I remember, to save the baker all the trouble of coming in, she'll go down, she'll get the bread. So she got the bread off the, the horse, and then the horse pinned her against the, the gate. <laughs> and she's got the bread under her arm, and every time she'd go like this, the head would come over this side, and then she'd go and lay it in <laughs> Not often you heard her swear, but, but she's a, she was a swearer when she got up that she? Oh, yes. I find that hard to imagine. <laughs> Bloody thing. And that, so the fence that you crashed into, is that the one the horse knocked over? Uh, or did, no, you knocked no, it over with the motorbike. motorbike. That was on the, the other side. We were on a corner. <laughs> Did you decide to buy a racehorse to start with? Stupid kids. <laughs> Actually, I, I was doing the pest work for Laurie Wall, and he had just sold his big stud out on the Nareen Road just before you get into Nareen. He said well, that he'll, he'll, he'll try and sell some of the stock. And he stood a horse call for Ronick. I was talking to him, and we had bought Cortez, the piebald, piebald or stripper ball. Anyhow, I said to him, well, you know, if you're going to sell the horses, probably looking for another one for pony clubs. Oh, yeah, OK, so he said, just go out, see George Hipperson, and he'll show you I'm old, and then you can tell me what you want, do you some sort of a deal. So he took me he took me out to see all the different horses, man, and they were, back in those days, $10,000, $12,000, saying, hey, I just want some for Pony Club. Anyhow, uh, I never thought any more about it, but I just sort of uh, walked away. But Laurie Wall never ever gave up, and he rang me at 7 o'clock one morning and said, now, Dave, um, see anything you like. And I'd seen a little two-year-old that I liked, but, I mean, he wanted... So it was somewhere between 2,250 or 3,000. It was in that bracket. I said, uh, you said, there's a little one that you like there. I said, oh, yeah, Laurie, uh, boy, I mean, but for Pony Club, you know, I'm not thinking of that sort of money. I don't know what cordy cost us about. 50 quid or dollars or something. Anyhow, he said, well, it, 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 oh, and he's saying, did you see her? And I could hear him talking to George Epperson in the background. He, yeah, he saw that one. He, so he said, look, make me an offer. I said, well, no, it's no good me making an offer because I can't come up anywhere near the figure. He said, hey, you won't offend me. You won't offend me. And I, so in the end, I, I reluctantly sent $1,000. So he said, good, sold. Yeah, come and get it. And I thought he would say, tell me no, you know, because I am so because I we really weren't in uh, a situation to be spending a thousand dollars on horse. So, uh, but that so then we put the syndicate together. He, he said to me, he said, "Hey, before you put it into pony club, why don't you see if it can run first? Put a little syndicate together." And so that, that's when we did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who was in that? Rio, and there was uh, 
Drunky Starkey, and uh, a couple of the guys from the Kenny Fogarty shops, you know. Uh, the Reef and... Yeah, those ones. Uh, Brian Lozman was one of them. One of them. He later shot himself. But anyhow, oh, and there was another guy who's Steve, sorry, Steve. Steve. His father was uh, Sergeant of Police. Oh, Steve Russell. Uh, Yes, up in Southport. Yeah. Steve, well, when she started to race like a man, she eventually did win a race. There was a few that she, she didn't. Steve was always putting all sorts of money on her, you know. And it turned out he was an insurance agent and he was really using the deposits people had put in for their insurance policies. <laughs> so uh, I really don't know what happened to him in the end. And, he, mm -hmm. and then, but, but she finally won one at Gold Coast, and, um, but uh, she chipped her knee. Then uh, I remember going, and she went through the post on, oh God, at last, you know, some woman behind me said, son, she said, how long have you been in horses? I said, oh, it's nearly six months now, you know, six months and you've had a winner. She said, I was 16 years before I got a winner. And I thought, well, man, if I was going to be 16 years, <laughs> But so, it, but it turned out that she threw one leg. So really, for we're starting to find out more about her since so it was no good to go into pony club because she couldn't act. She couldn't. Do it. So we put her to stud, and then uh, we put her to a French horse called Amarillo, and uh, we eventually then we raced the, the little bloke. Uh, the, the cult that it, she had. He was gelding by then. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he was, uh, we used to call him sport. Uh, well, when we were building the stables and that at Upper Coomera, he used to just come in to where we were building and walk in amongst all the planks and everything. And But he was always a weed of a horse. Mm. He did, and looked like he was never going to mature. And, and it wasn't until we actually put him into work. And, and we didn't put him into work until he was well into his three-year-old, I think it was. Then he, he grew and he grew upwards and outwards. And he, he won three races. Then the next year we put Mario to... Um, the Midnight Cowboy, who was at the same stud as uh, Amarillo, then she had uh, a filly, and it, that was uh, the cheeky cowgirl we called her, and she won five. Uh, we bought a share in a horse called Call Report, who was a full brother to Battle Wagon, who was a New Zealand sire. We paid three thousand for the share, and then so we put her to him, and well, it was the one we got from there. I think we sold that to, yeah. we sold one at auctions, at the auctions, and one went to the Dwyers, but, but something, one of them had hurt its foot or something, the one that went to the Dwyers, I think, I'm not going to find out, but it didn't, it never raced. Corey Port was a success at state, so he was then standing for $4,000 to serve, and we'd paid $3,000 for our share, uh, and then we sold it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the share. I don't think we got four thousand for the share. I'm not. Mm -hmm. We sure got our money back anyhow. That was a good time, and uh, I mean everybody, because you two, the girls were in the pony clubs every weekend. It was poor some and off floats, and uh, so you really just had to. And that's how you got involved with the racehorses because you were doing the, all the stuff anyhow. And then you took to training. Eh? You took to training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was good too, a break to the other stuff that you, you'd done. You used to take sports swimming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he was all right, but the cheeky cowgirl, she uh, she used to sort of roll over and all sorts of things and hoofs would be kicking oh. away. Because uh, yeah. I wasn't the best rower either of the boat. <laughs> I mean, sport used to pass me every now and then. So you're on one horsepower. <laughs>
quite a lot of architects work in it. I had a better run, I believe, than uh, a lot of the kids that were apprenticed. With one guy, actually, he was in my class at school. The apprenticeship was five years then, and he did five years making those red phone boxes for telecom. And he was apprenticed to telecom. So, oh, you know, oh. I couldn't believe that someone could spend five years. By the time I was in my, towards the end of my second year, uh, Clary Fisher used to drop me off onto a site. They, we used to have build a shed back in those days with corrugated iron and it wasn't a real secure shed but it, it, there wasn't the thieving and that that was now. And when we built the shed uh, I used to work with him setting the buildings out, what? wearing the property up and, and then marking all the where the stumps would go or the brick base and ready to where you took your plates and joists then to build the house and then by my third year I was doing it myself. Really? My house is out and I, I, I was frightened of him. If anything, if anything went wrong, I mean, you were going to cop it. And I, the first few days I was at work, I remember, you're doing everything. You're picking up bits of timber and sweeping up and just generally trying to look busy. And uh, there was a kid who was uh, about 18 months ahead of me. They were putting down a floor in the place at Camp Hill, at Sylvia Street in Camp Hill, I think was the name of it. And then all of a sudden, I heard one hell of an explosion of voices on the head. This guy really started ranting and raving, and this kid came racing out down the steps and onto his push bike and went. Clary Fisher had a, a big hammer in his hand, <laughs> like a, a sledgehammer. And what the kid had done, they, they, they had timber floors back in those days. The kid had cramped all the floors up, but hadn't knocked the joints up. So there was holes in the floor, you know, because so, and, and I'm try, trying to get the fire going, and I couldn't get it, and I'm blowing and blowing. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I moved my bike over nearer to the gate where I could get out quicker. So your apprenticeship's five years? Yeah. Yeah. And you survived? I survived. I survived. <laughs> hey, and I can be thankful because by the time my five years up, I was up, I, when I left him, uh, I went straight with another bloke and well, within about a month he made me leading hand, which I was, hey, I was 20 by then. Uh, but I, I, I had trouble with the leading hand bit because the older carpenters didn't like a kid, so I used to work alongside them, pace them, have everything set out for them, uh, and I got one pound ten over the award, which Gosh. made me seventeen pound ten a week, and then uh, and that's when I really um, took on the ice cream run. I uh, got the first the decent ute I, had, I could get. It was an Austin A40, and where well, I was getting seventeen pound ten a week. I used to make generally twenty three to twenty five pound for the two days. So then. Who got enough money together for a house, to start a house, and did parts of it. Prior to going to the coast with Vic, we built that place in Seagull Avenue. Ah, oh, the duplex at yeah, Nobby's. Yeah, we, we sold that for 7000 250 or something, but it was dollars that come in there. Uh, uh, was it pounds? No, it might have been pounds. Okay. Between, with that, we were, there was enough money then to buy uh, where Witten Court was in the Esplanade and, and to actually own the lands. It was £5,250. No, so there must, have, there must have been in pounds. So, and, and that's, it was from there that, we, well, it was on Witten Court that our licensing came in and with the size of Witten Court and the three stories of it and the concrete and the cranes and everything, I was able to get my open licence, which lets me build any high rise or whatever. I don't know how that takes me now, but... <laughs> And, and, and that one went well, and, and that sort of was the one that put me off into the tourist industry because I, I didn't know enough about what I was doing because I just pictured that you he, used to hear people saying, oh, they had one or two flats or a house and an agent let it for them, and you thought, well, that's what you do. But there's a rude awakening when that happens because if there's no one in there and you've got a, a loan from your finance company, you've really got to meet your commitment and all that. We started building at Witten Court and that's when I uh, got heavily involved with the Accommodation Owners Association, really just to find out what the hell do you do, really, and, and mm. it was a voluntary organisation, but it was a way of uh, trying to get some groundwork in to understand where you are up to. And uh, so then I soon found out then that I couldn't do the 
deals, I mean, with the airlines and that, because we only had 10 units. And when I first started off there, because we had one floor at a time, I only had four. Mm. We only had eight, you know. But then when I got involved with the accommodation owners, I never forget, I was a big guy. And he had near, we're top of the markets now, he had 15 units, and they were sort of motel units mainly. And they used to talk about these groups that he was getting, and, you know, a group was probably five or six people. But to me, a group just sounded like a group. You're getting all that. <laughs> How do you get these groups? You know? <laughs> and, but they, and then when I did the deal with the airlines, what I actually did, uh, I, I, I didn't realise uh, that I, I was doing it, but I actually cut him and other motels out because they, then they had access to apartments where they had a lounge room and, oh. and, and not, they didn't have to sit in a bedroom, you mm -hmm. know. So that w was good, but then I had to get the package going, so that's when I started going down to see all the travel agents and things like that, and then did the deals direct with uh, TAA, and uh, then Ian said, put the group scenario of the accommodation owners together because uh, at Witten Court uh, we just didn't have enough rooms for them to physically sell mm -hmm. because of the costs of them putting out the brochures and things like that. And plus they did want at Witten Court that it would be uh, uh, a daily service and breakfast supplied and I kept saying, well, you know, these are apartments. You don't need all that. They wanted us to uh, marry in with Ronnie Milken's store from Las Palmas and carry the breakfast over the fence. And we didn't do it, but it, it worked what we were doing in here. But, uh, and I guess to help get Witten Court underway, the, the guy who probably uh, was the most help to me was, uh, he gave me the most help, was Leo, Leo Lynch. Because he came down, and he and Mary had come down. I'd stay for the weekend. And then, because, and he said, well, uh, when we'd finish the first story, how are you going? You know, I said, well, okay, you know. He said, well, when you got all this done, why don't you sort of mortgage it and get up to the, and do the lot? And while he was telling me that, I knew he was a public servant, but I had no idea um, because I'd never been that sort of person. And if he even told me he'd, he'd breached under treasurer, I wouldn't have known what the under treasurer was. So uh, he said, well, uh, "Why don't you go and see and um, see if you can get some money?" He said, "You know, SGIO or someone might give it to you." And, you know, I said all the right things. Yeah, okay. But in my mind. I who would give me money? He came down a couple of times and he said, gee, you, you've never done anything about the finance. I said, oh, yeah, I, I probably will. But I didn't like to say to Leo, who's kind of blunt lend me money? You know, anyhow, he, he came down and he said, look, he said, uh, if Mohammed won't go to the mountain, the mountain lot's coming to Mohammed now. He said, I've made an appointment with you to see Butch riding up at the SGIA. I said, oh, when I start to bet him, this guy's going to laugh me out the door, you know. So uh, I went up and saw him, and uh, he went through all the things, and he was very businesslike and everything like that. And uh, then when and I got the money, and then uh, I said to, to the hey, I got that money. I didn't know that he was the chairman of the SGIO either. But then uh, when the other block of ground came available next door, yeah, when the other block came next door, I uh, went back to the SGIO. They gave me the money to buy that. So you uh, felt comfortable about asking them for money <laughs> by that stage? Uh, mum, uh, and, and mum was down again, and she said, you, you bought the one next door. She said, how much money do you owe? One next door cost us 40, and they gave me the whole 40,000 for that. So I think we owed 80 or 90,000 dollars, because dollars had come in then. She just shook her head and said, your father had died, because with him, if you couldn't pay for it, you couldn't afford it. So that's what I was brought up with. So uh, yeah, you've uh, really totally wiped that thought, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've become pretty good at getting it. Now. <laughs> it's paying it back. I have problems. So anyhow, uh, I, I finally, I, I s s then we saw went in court. So we picked up a hundred and forty thousand dollars had come in. We picked up a uh, hundred and forty thousand dollars in profit, $120,000. I've never seen money like that. And I, I honestly thought you retired. And, and seriously considered it, you know, just, oh God, it's, this is all happened for me, you know. Then we 
having and when I went uh, and paid the money out, I went up to the SGIO, and this book's writing that I Leo put me onto. I said, oh, "See, you didn't appreciate the loan, you know, because I paid it back. I paid a lot back, and it uh, made me feel a bit crook, you know, because." Uh, as far as they're concerned, they like to get money out, and that's finished. Mm. Uh, it stays out, and the income comes in. I tell Leo to <laughs> the old butchered money. Uh, he said he's getting too bloody old. Yeah, he said, anyhow, uh, he said, but don't you worry about it. And, uh, and see, uh, when we borrowed through them, the system was you made one payment every six months. Yeah, it was. A, I mean, no one's ever done that again. But to pay, pay a payment every six months just makes it so much easier for you. And, well, easier for you, but when I when I finished with Whitman Court, I still had some money over from what we borrowed, and I had enough for the first payment. And before I started getting really involved in the industry and was letting the agents just rent it out for me, uh, and every second or third week, out of eight units, you might have some money. That was all, yeah. you know. I could see I was never going to make the secondy. So, and, and that's that's when I oh, I went and saw Bruce Moore, and he was the guy who helped me. He, he was going taking this first lot of uh, meter maids away. So he said, "Well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that?" And I said, "Well, um, we've, we've got to work with the committee." He said, "You know how to work with the committee, don't you? You all put the information in, and you all sift through it, and then you come up with a conclusion. You know, and you've got to have enough numbers for it to go." He said, "Yeah." He said, "Sounds good." He said. If you want to be really successful, you want a committee of two, and hopefully one's away sick. So uh, he then uh, gave me the list of all the places he was going to, and I followed in the car a week later. By the time I got back home, the first people were in. Within a week of coming home, there was enough bookings that come through to pay for the trip, and then we never looked back. Yeah. And it just kept happening and happening, and uh, different ones were being sold up around us, and they're saying, how come you've got all the people? And I don't know how I'm new to this, it just happened, I was guess, you know, but I wasn't going to tell them what I'd been doing, or, or because everyone would be doing it. I, I did tell, it, uh, tell people afterwards, yeah. and, uh, and really uh, made it hard for myself, because uh, I, uh, everybody started calling and doing this if the sales course the way we were doing so it cut your market back but it was the package that we ended up with uh, it had the last meet we used to have one big meeting every year it was really good because you could do that in those days so right all the towers would put them up this year we'll put them up 10 percent or we'll put them up five percent or, or whatever where I had 96 properties, they had to be in tiers, because so, you couldn't have 96 different pro uh, prices, because it makes it too hard for the airlines, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you had about five prices, see, the first one I put together was $21.28, and the top of the range was $35 a week. In the early days, we used to have plus linen, plus TVs, we used to carry TVs from unit to unit, the old black and white ones, and they used to go on the fire, and was the salt used to get into them. And <laughs> so we, uh, and for the airlines, we had to put everything in. And that was actually the start of making it more professional, because people came in, and then at first we never used to put soaps in that, but as we went on, you really, the market said that's what you should do, and mm -hmm. So if you had everybody doing that, and uh, then and the airlines used to come to me every year for all the properties, self-contained properties on the coast, and I used to give them. TAA was the first one to do it, and then Ansett followed suit, and I'd give them all the uh, things because we'd arranged all the prices, and they'd say, oh, we and, and also to put it together, I had to get the guys to agree to pay 10% commission because no one paid commission back in those days. It, ma it really made it good. And then they brought in the law about collusion, and you could do anything, oh. and which we didn't take much notice of. But then one guy took me, he went to the, the, the department and, and got me in. Because uh, I think the fine, if they'd have got me, was something like forty thousand dollars. You know, you're doing things on a voluntary basis, and this bloody dodo would come in. We're trying to help him because he had a rate of X, Y, Z. He wasn't in one of the tiers, mm -hmm. so he had to put it up two or three dollars a week, or go down two or three dollars. You know, because so he he went and told them that I would. Uh, 
Holmes system that he had to make his property X amount a week. And so they had, my understanding was there was three. I knew of two, but there were supposedly three guys from uh, the department down trying to get enough evidence to get me charged. Luckily, all the guys shut their mouth. They said, no, we, we were all at the meetings. We know what happened and then no one has to charge anything. I mean, they make their own decisions. And to a point they did, because they came to, the, they had what their tariff was, but it might have to alter just a couple of dollars to be in the bracket anyhow. And that was collusion? That was collusion. So the airlines were guilty of that too? Yeah. Oh, hey, if you gave something, if I gave something to answer that was a dollar or two dollars different to what I gave TAA, I could give it to them at, say, midday, and by two o'clock, they'd ring me back to say, hey, you gave TAA this amount, so you were never going to beat them. Everybody at times just gets so fed up with what they're doing, wanted to do something else. And I used to sometimes get a hankering to go back building, because I did like that too. Mm. Uh, so what I did on a couple of occasions, so when, when it was really, really hot, I'd drive out into the new estates and sit in the air-conditioned car and watch the guys sweat in the sun, go back to the other thing. Oh, it's not too bad, because <laughs> the trouble with building, you always had all your, oh, well, even in what we were doing, you had money out, but with the building, you always put in all your money into a project, and if it goes bad, you're in trouble, you know. But uh, I'd do the same thing again if I had my time.